Psycho Killer. 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 Psycho
Patreon tiers. Yeah. And that's where those names come from, is from the podcast, since that's how we started. But let's get into Black Christmas. So this is from 1974. It was released on October 11th, okay. 1974, in Toronto. And then it was released on December 20th in, in 1974 in the U.S. All right. I mean, that's good that they were like, cool, this is a success. Let's put it out for Christmas. And when I was editing the reaction, I didn't realize that a lot of, there were a lot of Canadian actors. Yes. there. Everybody was saying a boot. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, shit. How did I not realize that? <laughs> Now, the budget for this movie was $686,000. Okay. That is, whoo, that is easy. I think now, I don't even know, can movies still be made with $686,000 now? In theory, yes, but will they be any good? Oh, girl, oh my God. Well, you I'm know what? I'm only kidding. We support I know, you girls. literally, all the, all the cinephiles are now logging on and being like, what the fuck, Cody? Actually, here's all, they're going to give you a list. They are. They're going to send you a, like, document, Google Drive. They're going to send it to you. <laughs> Uh, but the movie ended up grossing $1.3 million in Canada. Okay. Um, I don't know how much they made in the U.S., but in Canada, at least, I have that number. It was written by A. Roy Moore, uh, but I don't really recognize any of his other projects. There wasn't anything that really stood out or anything that I knew. Again, okay. I'm sure A. Roy Moore is like literally just sitting in his checks due to this movie, but... If there's anything that he's, like, done that I should know, you let me know, guys. Yeah. Now, it was directed by Bob Clark, who he actually has some, some things in his resume. He has created Porky's. Okay. A Christmas Story, which right. is very famous. A Christmas Story is probably, I like, I remember TBS, specifically, put on A Christmas Story 24 hours. Over and over again. <laughs> 24 hours of a Christmas story starting Christmas Eve at 8. And this is the adaptation of the book, right? No, I think you're thinking of a Christmas carol. Oh, I am thinking of a Christmas carol. A Christmas story is the don't shoot your eye out. Ah. And that story and the kid goes to Santa, he gets pushed down the slide. Um, I think his name is Ralph. I've never seen it. Sorry. Oh, my God. Cody is dropping some bombs <laughs> in this episode today. Um, but A Christmas Story is super famous, and it I remember it being on TBS, and I actually didn't mind it, because once it finished, it restarted. It's good to just keep in the background, mm -hmm. except for all the commercials in between. But he also made Baby Geniuses, which is a movie that, I don't know why it struck a nerve with me, because I remember seeing the trailers to that movie. I think Baby Geniuses were like talking babies. I, I've never seen the actual movie, but Me I neither. saw trailers, and I believe there are talking babies, and they're super smart. Okay. And, they're, you know, hilarity ensues. <laughs> um, but apparently, Bob Clark directed that movie, uh, but he also uh, contributed, and you'll see in a little bit, a bit, is Billy's shadow and some of the voice uh, oh. parts. Yeah, so it was all hands on deck for this movie. But Cody is actually going to be, as he usually does, Telling us who is in the cast. Yes, and uh, please forgive any pronunciation mistakes, uh, but we have. Yeah, that we <laughs> needed someone in handy when we did the episode on audition, but you did well. I, I, <laughs> I, I think I so. I think I did well. Yes. So uh, our cast is Olivia Hussey as Jess. We have Kier Dalia as Peter. We have Margot Kidder as Barb. John Saxon as Lieutenant Fuller. Marion Waldman as Mrs. McHenry. Uh, Andrea Martin as Phil, Nick Mancuso as Billy and the phone voice, Bob Clark as Billy's shadow, and Albert J. Dunk as Billy's point of view. And I believe Albert J. Dunk was kind of like the camera operator. Mm -hmm. But again, don't. This is the amount of research that we put into our show. Uh, anyone in the cast that you recognize? John Saxon, of course. And I've definitely seen Andrea Martin and stuff too. I I saw her on Broadway. Really? She was in, yeah, she was in the revival of Pippin, Ooh. and she played the grandmother, and she is fabulous. She is so funny, and I love that she's had, like, a resurgence of her career lately. Like, she's she's been in a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. um, 
I recognize two other two other actresses, Olivia Hussey, which for me, oh my, I don't know why, but there's something about her name that I just want to be like, Olivia Hussey. <laughs> Olivia, that's just like puss. You know, like I feel like she should, well, she should be a like drag queen, but at the same time, uh, she's also just very elegant. I actress. do think Olivia Hussey is uh, a good drag name. Mm -hmm. Hussey is like a term for a slut. Oh, that's why. Yes. That's why. Oh, I can hear now. That hussy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I recognize Olivia Hussey because she was in Romeo and Juliet, the movie version from like 1960 something. And I remember that movie being played in a lot of my classes when okay. I was in high school. Um, so I remember her from that and I've always seen her her in clips in this. And I was like, oh fuck, I know that girl. Um, not personally, obviously, but the other actress that I know is Margaret Kidder. Okay. She plays Lois Lane in some of the oh, Superman movies. Yeah, I have heard that, yes. I want to say, it's, it's not a TV show, right? It's the movies with uh, Christopher Reeves, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to just say allegedly. Every single time, so nobody comes at me for misinformation. Now, we always also like to kind of dive into the Rotten Tomato scores uh -huh. for these movies. Oh, I, I know that Rotten Tomatoes is here or there. Like, it really shouldn't mean anything. But just so you guys know what the consensus is out there, uh, Rotten Tomatoes score for this movie from Chris Black Christmas 1974, Tomato Meter for the critics is 73%. Okay. And audience score is 76%. Wow. It's, I feel like you don't normally see them so close to Yeah, them. right? I'm also really surprised to see a high critic score from a horror movie. I mean, yeah. I, I do... I do agree with this score. Honestly, I feel like it should be higher, but I, I haven't read all of their reviews, so I want to know what their what the consensus is overall. Where yeah. people were like, "Where's the flaws in this?" Which they are, which they are. I, I think we can talk about it later on. But here are some tidbits that I gathered uh, based on this movie. There are a few. I want to say maybe six, which is actually not a lot. Not a lot. We'll we'll get in quick and quick and easy here, guys. So a little bit of tidbits for this movie. According to director Bob Clark, the original script for the film featured murder scenes that were more graphic. Okay. Clark, however, felt that it would be more effective if the murders were toned down and kept subtle on screen. Writer Roy Moore liked the idea as well. I think this is interesting because you can definitely see that compared to the 2006 Black Xmas movie. Um where they definitely went on the more graphic side. It's so strange because I feel like horror in those times were in very like graphic yeah. sections of those times. So like you, 1974 was the premiere of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty graphic. Yeah. You saw a lot of sh disturbing shit in that. But also around this time, I don't know the year, but you also had Last House on the Left. And that was oh, yeah. very gritty, very mm -hmm. just like you're watching things that you just never would see. So like, you know, it's kind of expected to to go down that road. Yeah. But I'm very, very glad they didn't because I think so much of it works because we were still scared even without all the gore or all the all the things that we saw. Yeah, I do think that there's something to be said about leaving it to the viewer's imagination too. Yeah. That it like it makes it a little bit worse than actually Oh yeah, it. for sure. And we'll talk about Black Xmas in a little bit, but that I to kind of connect my idea what I was talking about before is that in that time, 2006, you also have Saw. Yes. And so people were like, "Oh, that's what's getting butts to the seats." We got to go more into it. And you'll see that it kind of, the, the original director for Black Xmas mm -hmm. originally didn't want to go down that route. So we'll talk about it there because okay. that's, that's some drama. Reportedly, writer Roy Moore took inspiration for the story from an actual series of murders that took place in Montreal, Quebec around the Christmas season, along with the urban legend, The Babysitter and the Man Upstairs. And the babysitter and the man upstairs is like a, a very old urban legend that is the origin of the famous The Call is Coming from Inside the House. Oh my God. And it's so creepy. Um, honestly, I like 
things like that freak me out a lot. So. It's, I mean, we said it in the reaction, but those words, the call is coming from inside the house. And I do think that it originated, like that line originated in Black Christmas and then was used again, like more uh, to, a, to a different extent mm -hmm. in When a Stranger Calls. Um, it just, it just, th that kind of like, dives deep under my skin like it just it freaks me out and the idea of the, uh, the fact that this idea I, I don't know i think you looked it up how long ago the the story the babysitter and the man upstairs it goes originates. back to like the early 60s is when it starts to become prevalent um it's believed to have originated after a similar murder happened in the 50s but I, I didn't have a chance to look up more into that yeah. actual murder. But, I mean, that's crazy. So that means it wasn't even that long until they grew inspiration from that yeah. urban legend and then made this movie. So I want to say Black Christmas was probably one of the, one of the first to kind of grab at it. I mean, I'm sure there's others where, like, phone calls were, like, involved and, you know, spooky stuff was happening. But just the idea of you're alone, it's not your house, uh, you're babysitting some kids... Uh, you're getting pranked and you kind of feel watched, which is what Scream, like the first few minutes of Scream, kind of really honed in on was yeah. the idea of you're being watched. Um, just so, it's just so scary. And the fact that it could be based on actual, like actual murders mm -hmm. makes it even worse because someone did live this. Um, so NBC scheduled this film for its primetime network debut on January 28th, 1978 under the title strangers in the house, sorry, stranger, just one in the house on January 15th, 1978, two female students at Florida state university were murdered by an assailant who broke into the sorority house where they lived. Three other young women in the immediate vicinity were attacked and assaulted. NBC received numerous pleas from locals to pull the movie from the broadcast in light of the crimes. And after first stating that they would offer the local affiliates an alternative movie to broadcast, they decided to just pull the plug on the movie together. Instead, the film Doc Savage, Man of Bronze, was shown. NBC instead ran Stranger in the House as a late movie on May 14th the same year. Okay. The perpetrator of the crimes at Florida State University was later identified as serial killer Ted Bundy. Oh, shit. I was even thinking, like, when you said Florida State University, I was like, isn't that Ted Bundy? Yeah. Wasn't that who yeah. that was? That's isn't that so wild that Ted Bundy delayed this movie's release. And, and you know, though, I, I don't know which decade, but, like, I want to say the 80s is where the rise of the whole, like, movies are kind of being the source of all these killers or yeah, like that that's it was, what it was the eight i think the 90s especially well because the 90s made the shift towards video games too but oh yeah, yeah. It, was, it, it was definitely in the same vein as the satanic panic stuff that happened yeah. in the eighties. and you can just sense like the the rise of that this is yeah. where like the tension is building movies like this and again you can consider this movie to be a slasher though i read that the director says this is more like a psychological thriller in his eyes but you can see the elements of it being a slasher yeah but at the core of it it is very disturbing the the, the things that you know you you have women in this house no one's listening to them mm -hmm. they're getting prank called and being called very awful things they're alone uh all the adults are kind of like out and not really knowing what the fuck is happening and they're being assaulted in vulnerable positions yeah so like it's very scary and you never see the person who does it oh ooh, ooh. i think that's probably the single and and i, I don't want to get too much to the discussion in the yeah, beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. but i think that's the single scariest thing about this movie is that you never see the killer you only ever see his eye well you can also well no because you kind of know that it's not the the, the boyfriend at yeah. the end but you, you don't know that if he was involved or not which is always an ambiguous thought it's never confirmed or not yeah so next is the audio for the demented phone calls was edited into the film during post-production. Okay. While shooting the footage for the phone call scenes, the actresses were actually reacting to threatening dialogue being spoken from director Bob Clark from off camera. 
So I don't even know what he was saying. Maybe he was like saying completely different things, or maybe they already knew. Maybe it was already in the script, and that he was just repeating it. Um, but I don't know. I, the audio that we hear in the film is crazy. It's so disturbing. It's it's like, and the, and the worst part is you don't see any visuals. Yeah, you're just seeing the reactions from the women, but just the way that they're distorting the the voice and how it switches back and forth but some of it is just piercing in your ears mm -hmm. it's unsettling so i kind of feel bad for the actresses because they really had to kind of pull in their weight on this yeah it's not like in scream where roger l jackson was like the you know he was like somewhere else but you can hear him in the phone you know saying all these creepy shit um, so actress Lynn Griffin revealed that for the scenes where she's wrapped in a plastic bag, which okay. is something I was asking about, uh, she would rip a hole in the bag, stuffing the opening into her mouth and poke nose holes in the bag with a pencil so she could breathe during filming. Being a swimmer also helped with holding her breath in the bag. That makes sense because I feel like, you know, I mean, you would need to obviously or you would actually die. But I, uh, <laughs> I also think that like... Um, like it would, it would be really easy to tell if someone was actually breathing in the plastic bag because you'd see the condensation build up, you'd see it like moving in yeah. breath. So, well, okay, we're not. So, my reaction to this is, fuck, they actually put this girl in this bag, yeah, and had her like hold her breath, and then in between takes would just be like breathing, right? Uh huh. Crazy. Would you? Would that even fly nowadays? I I don't see why not. As long as they made holes for it. That sounds so dangerous. It's so scary. I think it'd be fine. I'd do it. Oh, oh my god. Okay, fine. We're gonna do a bit at <laughs> at, at the end of this. We're gonna put a bag over Cody's head. Um, <laughs> no, I I you know someone suffering from claustrophobia. I don't think I would be able to take. Oh it. yeah, you can never. Wow. <laughs> I heard that shade. You were like, you could never. I shade. I'm trying to you would for never. You. You're not. You're a breathing queen. How fucking dare you? Uh, so actress Lynn Griffin. Wait, we, I already said that. that Sorry. The composer of the film score, Carl Zittrer, started in an interview. Stated in an, in an interview that he created the film's mysterious music by tying forks, combs, and knives into the strings of the piano to warp the sound of the keys. Ooh. This is so fucking cool. Like, imagine just being I wouldn't like, even think of that. Let's try to see what this would sound like, and if it's scary, let's use it. Ah, amazing. Zitcher also stated that he would distort the sound further by recording its sound onto an audio tape and make the sound slower. The audio for the disturbing phone calls was performed by multiple actors, including Nick Mancuso and director Bob Clark, which we already know. Mancuso stated in an interview that he stood on his head during the recording sessions to compress his thorax and make, make his voice sound more demented. Oh, my God. That's commitment. Yeah. That's a commitment that I should be aiming for, but I'm never going to. Um, Mancuso <laughs> spent only three days recording dialogue for the character, later recalling the experience as being very avant-garde, with Clark encouraging him to improvise the character's voice. That sounds really interesting. I would never have thought to, like stand on my head so that my voice would sound different yeah i mean i i think this is awesome i this, these are one of those moments where i just wish i was there in the yeah. room how they created this i i like i'm so jealous i was not born in 1974 well no i, I have to be born a little bit earlier oh also another fun fact this is the 49th year oh so it's gonna be a there's That's there, right. they better release some like 50th anniversary 50th anniversary box set and if you can send cool. us one please do i would love it all right so that is black xmas from 1974 i think we wrapped that up pretty pretty nice and neatly yeah. there's obviously a lot more information a lot has gone into this movie uh but we couldn't we'd be here for like three hours we would be. um so please go i think there's like a, a 4k version that came out from like screen factory so i think they have a lot more behind the scenes but if you want to read up on it please do there's also you know how like movies used to get i don't know if they still do but you know how they used to get like novelizations yes like afterwards apparently black christmas had one it did and they like wait how do you know because i saw it on the wikipedia page oh, wow okay cody just spoiling himself <laughs> over here but I like if okay if anybody wants to buy me one and try to scour 
eBay and try to get one, I would love the novel novelization of this because apparently they flesh out the characters a little bit more and they flesh out the like history of the sorority. And stuff I think like that. this would make a great graphic novel, actually. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so let's go over to Black Xmas from 2006. The release date was November. Wow, I can't read. <laughs> December 25th, Christmas Day on in 2006. Okay. The budget was $9 million. Wow. Opening weekend, it only made $3.7 million. And guess what, girl? I contributed to that $3.7 million on opening weekend. Did you? Yeah, because I told my mama, and I only live like, like a few blocks away from the movie theater, uh -huh. but I said to my mom, I'm going to see Black Christmas, and she went to take me and my brother. Mm -hmm. She bought the tickets, and she let me go. And with my brother. This and is we a went... wild movie to see. Oh, yeah. I don't <laughs> I don't think we got the unrated version, so I don't think we got all the extra blood and guts. Okay. But um, I do remember, like, I was like, I need to see this movie. There were so many actresses in it, in it that I knew mm -hmm. that I was like, I need to go see this movie. I love this movie. And so I went to go see it opening night. But it also grossed over $21.5 uh, $21. million at the box office right. worldwide. It was written and directed by Glenn Morgan, who is also famous for Final Destination, mm -hmm. Final Destination 3, The One, and this movie called Willard, which was, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was like this weird guy from the Charlie's Angels movies. All, all I remember is somebody in like a bunny costume or something. Oh, no, I think you're thinking of Donnie Darko. No, I'm not thinking of Donnie Darko. No, this is the guy with the rats. Willard oh. like likes rats. I don't know. I must be thinking of a different movie. I th I want to say it's Donnie Darko. I'm I know for a fact. I'm oh, not The Shining. Of Donnie Darko. I'm not thinking of The Shining. Guy in a bunny suit. I have I have a picture of some on on the cover. All I don't right, know. on the cover, bunny suit. What else? We can move on. No, I want to know. I, I I'm telling you, I don't know. I thought it was this movie. All right, everybody, let us know in the comments or wherever you can reach out to us, Discord. Uh, I mean, <laughs> let it know. let it be known that I am not the pop culture person at trivia. <laughs> so, like, I'm very likely completely wrong here. I'm just saying that that's what I thought it was. All right, so our cast for this movie. Mm hmm. Uh, we have Katie Cassidy playing Kelly Presley, Michelle Trachtenberg as Melissa Kitt, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Heather Fitzgerald, Lacey Chabert as Dana Mathis, Kristen Cloak as Lee Colvin, Andrea Martin returns as Barbara McHenry, Crystal Lowe as Lauren Hannon, Oliver Hudson as Kyle Autry, and Karen Conneval as Constant Lens. And there's a lot more to the list. We're, yes. we're just saying like some of the main players. Um, anybody that you recognized here? Oh, my goodness. Well, of course I recognize Lacey Chabert. I, I would be <laughs> a bad gay if I didn't. <laughs> um, but other than that, I mean, I wasn't really watching a lot of, like, a lot of popular TV and movies yeah. when I was Because they locked age. you in a basement, your parents. That's not true. You know, they, We're they, not they putting that on record. <laughs> no, I just... They chained up the TV, you I, know? No, I just didn't watch a lot of this stuff. So I wasn't... <laughs> and, and even if I did, I wouldn't have really known the actors because my brain doesn't work that way. I remember. No, yeah. So, um, I, but I definitely remember Lacey Chabert. Um, and Andrew uh, Martin, of course. Who, so Katie Cassidy actually was in the movie... Um, when a stranger calls the remake mm -hmm. which i also saw on opening night um and i knew michelle trachenberg of course she was in a lot of nickelodeon stuff or stuff when she was little and uh she was in i don't know if ice princess came out around this time but she was also in buffy the vampire slayer which is a spoiler alert sorry she does end up being on the show at some point um, Cody hasn't seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer, by the no, way. No, but we are going to be watching it next year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mary Elizabeth... I always have to feel like royal. Mary Elizabeth Winstead is also in this cast. I want to say I wasn't as familiar with her when it first came out, but I do... No, lies. She was in Sky High, which I totally forgot about, and I love that movie, and I think this came out before it, and also Final Destination 3, I think, came out before this movie. Mm -hmm. So... Never mind. I actually knew exactly who Mary Elizabeth Winstead was, and I'm so glad that she was in this. She's iconic, and I still love her to this day. And she is now married to Ewan McGregor. Oh. Yeah. And also, she was in Scott Pilgrim versus the World, which is another movie I love. 
I knew Lacey Chabert, as you said, Mean Girls. Apparently, Amanda Seyfried, which I, I think that's how you pronounce her name, or Seyfried, was supposed to be in this movie really? as, uh, as Mary Elizabeth Winstead's character, I believe. Huh. But they said they didn't want to have two Mean Girls uh girls from the from that movie so they just chose lazy chabert um and of course andrea martin i didn't know her at the time but you know we we know her now okay so ron tomatoes very different <laughs> from black christmas tomato meter was 14 percent oh yeah 14 percent people did not like this movie and audience score was 38 percent i think the critics they just don't get it uh, I mean, I also don't think I get it, but I love it. <laughs> if Fair. that makes sense. Like, I think there's just so many questionable things, but I also, I think that adds the charm to the movie. But at the same time, I do get why critics didn't like it. You, you know, know? they do say that one out of 10 people is uh, is on the LGBTQ spectrum. So okay. 14% that tracks. That tracks, It was, it was yeah. all, all the gays were, were like, gonna yes, go, give us more. I thought you were going to go down the Lady Gaga quote. It was like, 99 people could could not believe in you, no. but you have one person, no. which is us. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's go over to the tidbits. Uh, this is, I kind of want to say like titty bits, but I'm not going to say that. But I did. After his debut feature, Willer, 2003, a remake of an earlier 1971 film, failed to perform well at the box office. Morgan was approached by Dimension Films to write and direct a remake of Black Xmas, the Black Christmas 1974. Morgan was a fan of the original film and cited it as a pre predecessor to the modern slasher film, which mm -hmm. is actually very true. Yeah. Uh, which is which influenced his decision to commit to the remake. Star Crystal Lowe noted Morgan's admiration and aim to take the film to a different level while respecting the fact that the original was a great movie to begin with. That's true. Mm -hmm. But I mean, at this time, there was an influx of remakes coming oh, yeah. by. Like Black Christmas was bound any second. And I think that's why they were like, you got to do it because you just did Final Destination, Final Destination 3. You got to do it. I think it was like any second now they were going to make a black christmas remake mm -hmm. at this time in conceiving a new script morgan had intended to rework elements of the original film that were left ambiguous or implied such as the cryptic phone calls received by the sorority house while writing the screenplay morgan received input from the film's original director bob clark who also signed on to serve as an executive producer Ooh, for the remake Oh, that's cool clark gave morgan his blessing stating in an interview that the remake was still black christmas but explored new subplots that had not been fleshed out in the 1974 film i agree i mean this is and and we will talk about it more later when we talk about like the the specific comparing the two yeah but i think that um I'll put a little asterisk on it f because we will discuss it more <laughs> later. But I think that generally speaking, this is a, a great example of how to do a remake where you're bringing back a lot of the core elements, but you're still able to take it in a slightly different direction. So it's not just like the exact same word for word, oh, shot yeah. for shot remake. Yeah, I hear you. In writing the character of Billy, Morgan was inspired by the life of Edmund Kemper, a real-life serial killer who, as a child, had been locked in the basement by his home by his mother, whom he later murdered. Mm -hmm. Which, once, once I saw this note, I was like, oh, yeah, yep. I totally see that. Yep. In casting the sorority sister characters, Morgan sought actresses who were of the same caliber in order to avoid typecasting of the final girl and the supporting characters. Oh, that's smart. It's so smart, because... Everybody was at their peak in at in this year, 2006. All the, all these women were just perfect. Like everybody had their shining moments elsewhere, you yeah. know. And I could see, and it, it it was actually true. Like if you saw the trailer now, if maybe they remade the trailer and um, modernized it a little bit, you pro and if you didn't know about the movie, you probably wouldn't be able to pick out who the final girl was. Yeah. Because all of them could be the final girl in their own right. Mm -hmm. Which was perfect. And honestly, I feel like more movies should do that nowadays. Yeah, I agree. According to Morgan, he was contacted by the Weinsteins who wanted to pick up some shots for TV spots, to which he agreed. Okay. Among the footage shot was... Okay, and so this is 
infamous. Mm -hmm. This is infamous in in my mind, and I guess people who love Black Christmas. But there was a bunch of scenes that were in the trailer that I was looking forward to, and I remember being disappointed. Um, that were not in the original film. I do remember you telling me this when we first watched it because I think you made me watch, watch, the, the, watch yes. the, the thing and I was like, oh, like 90% of this is not in the movie. It was so disappointing because actually a lot of the stuff that was in the trailer was really cool. So if you're going to put stuff in your trailer that is not in the actual movie, don't make it cool. Yeah. Don't make it like this fucking fantastic thing and not have it featured in the film. Yeah. But these are some of the things that we missed out on. So there was a footage shot that was of Lacey Chabert being dragged through the snow, okay. footage of a woman falling from the roof where there is a weird lawnmower electric Christmas light thing that was pulling. I, I want to say it was Lacey Chabert as well. Okay. And an unidentified woman played by Jillian Murray discovering a woman floating beneath a frozen lake. Um, I wonder if <laughs> I wonder if that shot was supposed to be related to uh, or a callback to the original Black Christmas. How so? Because in the original Black Christmas, they have a, a subplot where they're going through and two of the oh, girls. Oh, yes. And one of the girls ends up finding the body. That's probably what they were like. Oh, you want extra shots? Here's some things that we actually didn't see and we could see. Um Michelle Trachtenberg aiming a shotgun and saying, Merry Christmas, mother. And you know that they cut up and just be like, Black Christmas. Honestly, that should have been in. Merry Christmas, motherfucker. motherfucker come I, on. Perfect. Come on. That's like a yippee kaye, motherfucker. Yes. But so there are also additional shots of Trachtenberg in a hallway holding a shotgun while Billy levitates above her on the ceiling. Yes, I remember. It's like below. And Michelle Trachtenberg is like looking yonder and with, I think with the shotgun and all you see is him like Spider-Manning it on the ceiling. And I'm like, what, what, this is so fucking crazy. I don't know how they would, I mean, what I want to know is how they would be able to connect that footage if it was actually in there. I mean, obviously, Billy spent the entire time that he was in prison uh, doing the Uma Thurman from Kill Bill. Oh, workout. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she does that at one point. Oh, maybe that's the inspiration. I don't know when Kill Bill came out. Maybe 2003? I thought it was 2004. Close, but then it would have been around the same yeah. time. Anyway. <laughs> um, this footage, which was never incorporated into the film, did appear in the official trailer as well as televised uh, spots. Wild. Um, did yeah. nobody check this? Like Fool, <laughs> Fooled me. But other movies have done it also. Like Paranormal, Paranormal Activity was infamous for doing that as well. Well, but like Paranormal Activity, that's... That's kind of one thing. I feel like that's that it makes sense for them. Like this doesn't make any sense. You shouldn't have so much <laughs> of your trailer be so good and then not be in the movie at all. Yeah, I would have loved that like light lawnmower electric thing. That would have been so fucking cool. Uh, so Glenn Morgan approached Mary Elizabeth Winstead about the movie at 4 a.m. in the airport after finishing Final Destination 3 with her. After being hesitant at first, after only just finishing a horror movie, she agreed to the role of Heather because she is a fan of the 1974 version. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if she also was told to do a Southern New Orleans accent, um, but apparently she did not prepare for it. <laughs> so after this film's critical and financial failure, which is true, this is considered a box office bomb. Um Bob Clark began to work on a straight-up sequel to the original film with Clark as director and Olivia Hussey and John Saxon reprising their roles of Jesse Bradford and Lieutenant Ken Fuller, respectively, with Jess being the new house mother of the sorority house. His untimely passing, however, prevented this idea from ever coming to fruition. Um, yes, unfortunately, he has passed. Rest in peace to infamous Bob Clark for bringing us this. I'm also really interested, like, now I almost wish that this had been made because I would have really liked to see, I mean, number one, how they explain after the end of the first one how Jess is still alive. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I kind of assume that Jess is a goner. Yeah, for sure. But, I mean, that's just us. Mary Elizabeth Winstead stated that during breaks, she would often read message boards and comments on the idea of the original film being remade and be entertained by the hate and outrage. Oh, my God. She's just like, yeah, fucking ugh, light it up, bitches. 
There were three alternate endings shot for the film. Okay. The first ending had Lee and Kelly engage in a heartwarming talk with Lee opening Claire's present. The ending concluded with Kelly getting a call from Kyle's phone, implying either Agnes or Billy survived. The second ending had Lee being brought to the morgue to examine Agnes's body, only to find Claire's body revealing that Agnes escaped while Billy dies from his burns. The ending concludes with Lee being killed by Agnes. And Kelly electrocuting Agnes and being picked up by her parents. Okay. This ending was used in the UK version. The third ending had the morticians discovering Billy's body is missing while a shot inside a smoke detector on the wall reveals that Billy escaped. Okay. Um, and apparently, I think the UK... So, yeah, UK got one of the alternate endings and the, the US got something different. Um, and I think all of it is kind of included in the um the the dvd version of the movie but there is the ending that we got because apparently glenn morgan and his like uh like industry partner i forgot his name i believe it's james wong um who also worked with him in final destination 3 and final yeah. destination um they were at odds with the weinstein brothers um they were just like not liking their involvement they were always getting in arguments they were asking a lot from them they were changing things in the script okay. they were saying you need to make it more brutal you need to be like i think one of the quotes that bob clark said that is michelle trachenberg there needs to be like a scene where like billy is dragging her by her eyeballs um <laughs> that that would have been too much it would have been i mean the movie that we have is also a little bit too much too there's yeah like, he apparently the brothers uh, asked for the cannibalistic plot that that they put in there again because they wanted to compete with saw that was coming out and they also asked for like a much bigger ending which is why we got that like billy gets impaled by the christmas tree ending. i mean honestly i like the i like the ending we got but i do think like any of these makes more sense well because you have to understand that Glenn Morgan wanted there's a whole different vision yeah. of this movie that he wanted and it didn't really pan out and he stated in an interview saying that he actually and he doesn't disown this movie but he regrets a lot of it because of the involvement of Dimension and how it changed his film and it's not what he originally wanted to do and he felt bad because Bob Clark really like gave his blessing and was like this is what we wanted and it kind of was something very different yeah. um which I guess added to kind of the mess that it is, but it is a mess that I love because it's just so fucking bonkers. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like the actresses really hone in on what they're doing. I yeah. feel like they know what this is, you yeah, know? I agree. I just think that like, like seeing these alternate endings here makes me think like, why did both Billy and Agnes survive? I don't know. Well, both of them. Bob Clark wanted, not Bob Clark, Glenn Morgan wanted to keep a, a sort of ambiguous ending, just like which, the original Which one. I think is a good homage to the original. Yeah. Well, because I think at some point the movie does end. Like, when you're watching it, it's like, oh, they're adding another scene. Like, yeah. they're, you know, we yeah. we could have ended this right then and there. Right, they cut to outside the house, and then you, like, you you could easily just have them be like, all right, here's the body from the attic. And the girls turn to each other and be like, what? Only one body? And then that's it. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. We only found one or something like that. All right, guys. So that is our bloody appetizer segment. Please stay tuned after this break when we come back with our meats and potatoes segment. So stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back, ghouls. It is now time to go into our Meats and Potatoes segment. And this is the segment where we actually go into the movie itself. And it's going to be a different setup for this one because we are going to just be comparing both movies. Yep. 
on certain things. So let's talk about both opening kills. Okay. Both of them include kills regarding Claire. Yep. Um, and they kind of seem a little bit more similar. Yes. Right? They're, Claire in Black Xmas from 2006 is wrapping up a present. Yep. Uh, she's alone. Everyone else is downstairs. This also environment is very not as lively as the 1974 version, mm -hmm. right? The 1974 version is there's a bunch of, ev like, everyone's there. I think the whole sorority might be there, along with, like, the house mother. They're having a very big gathering, and it seems kind of like everybody likes each other. In this one, in 2006, it, it seems like every girl is kind of not about each other as much. Um, but I think that's where kind of, like, the big differences are mm -hmm. uh besides that both of them get a bag over their head yeah i i do think that i like the claire death from 2006 a little bit more because it's almost a little more believable um well it's a there's a different kind of setup yes because you know, in this one agnes is like under the bed and she surprises her and then yeah. gets the bag on the head whereas in the original one she walks over to the closet and then she pulls Whoa. all of her clothes but out of the closet. But you also see, you get a, a, a shot, a close-up of a, like, what's it called? It's like some sort of curtain or some yeah. sort of, like... There's a, it, well, it looks like a dry-cleaning bag or something. Dry-cleaning dry cleaning bag, and then you see the figure of a face. And you don't know who, who that is, but there is a person there. Yeah. There's a person hiding. And so the suspense is already building up here. Oh, yeah, the suspense was great. But part of me is like, how did she not see that? I mean, that's true, but I... I mean, I don't think I would. Realistically, I don't think All right, I would bat an eye. I'm going to hide in the closet later behind no, a... No, <laughs> no. But Black Xmas takes it a little bit, a bit step forward, a step further, because uh -huh. I think they use something and stab her eye out. The scissors. The from... scissors. Oh, no, it's not the scissors. It's the pen. The she pen, was writing with yeah, like a yeah. fancy, old-fashioned yeah, calligraphy Jesus. pen for her sister who she has you know no relationship with you know what they wanted to recreate the relationship i think it was a wash that she got her which personally i don't think it looks that great but to each their own i'm well, sure she, she doesn't loved it. know her sister it was taste. engraved too i think it was like sisters oh, forever or something like that's that that's cute like <laughs> but she gets she gets a little bit more of a graphic death she her bag is also um not clear it's a like black bag yes um, which is different, which results in having the shots where Claire's in the attic um, have different reactions to. Mm -hmm. Because in the original one, you saw her face. You yeah. saw her, like, her, her reaction didn't change. And that's what's scary about it every time we pan back to Claire. It's just like her her mouth is still open it's kind of like she's still like suffocating and we have to keep reminding ourselves of that yeah which is very very scary but in this one it's black so like it kind of makes me feel like the actress is not there so they could just have a body double oh, just like yeah. sitting there which is probably the mo the easiest thing to do um but i will give points to black xmas for uh, black christmas from 1974 for having the actress go through with that yeah i do think that that is it that one is definitely scarier um especially like you said that we come back to claire multiple times throughout the movie and she just always has that like horrified look on her face it's so scary but i mean overall these openings are pretty effective at introducing this to the characters like we get their relationships in Black Christmas 2006 really well. Like mm -hmm. I feel like they interact really well. I think the chemistry is there. We get what kind of what kind of women they are. Uh, we have the house mother uh, being really really funny, which I really like. Um, but I do have to lean more for the 1974 version because we have that POV. Yeah, we have the POV of the guy just like stumbling upon this house and then climbing up the what's it called the scaffolding it's not scaffolding but the like trellis the, or that, lattice nah, or whatever nah, 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 nah. i don't know but <laughs> <laughs> that he climbs it he goes into the attic so you see the process you don't know who it is but you see the process of the mm -hmm. guy just being there and then you know we we then go right into the the, the women having fun 
they're having like a little party before everyone leaves for Christmas break, I believe. Um, so there's a lot of setup there. Yeah. And I do also think that like another thing that just makes it a little scarier for the original version mm -hmm. is that like because we have that opening shot where we see everyone is in the house and it's all lively and everything is going on. That the yeah. fact that he can kill Claire and get her through the hallway up into the attic. And no one can hear a thing. Nobody hears anything. Nobody Nothing. sees it. No one knows that like you think that when you're in a house surrounded by all your friends, you're safe, but it takes mm -hmm. that away from you right away. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk about the cast themselves. The black Christmas cast versus the black Xmas cast. What, what do you think? Of the, the two casts. I think I liked the black X-Men's cast a little bit more. I do. Not only because like they're they're like more familiar faces and we're like we're like, yes, honey, like enjoying when they're just like <laughs> they're fierce, they're good. Even the sister. We're the taking shots of tequila and chasing it with red wine. Oh my wine. god. That's and just she, iconic. She was so relatable too. But I I will say I think the original one has standouts. Yes. Um, which is obviously Olivia Hussey, mm -hmm. who plays Jess. Jesse? Jess. Jess. I will, and I remember rewatching it when we were, I was editing the reaction, but when she is yelling to um, Phil and Barb to, to say something back, mm -hmm. oh, oh, bitch. That gave me goosebumps. That performance, like you can hear the desperation and how scared she was in that moment because she just found out that the call is coming from inside the house. She's looking back and she's being told to get out of the house, but she knows that Barb and Phil are still back there. They don't know that they're dead. Mm -hmm. So she has to, in that moment, acting wise, she is a person who is scared. She doesn't know who's, she, she knows that someone is in the house. She knows her friends are there. She has to process the fact that if they don't talk back to her, her friends are dead. Mm -hmm. And oh, bitch, when she's like, Bart, please say something. I was about to cry. Yeah. She, oh my God. She delivered performance. She delivered. I, I'm sorry, but I can't say the same about Black Xmas. But <laughs> the thing is, collectively, that cast in the 2006 version is still really good. Yeah. And they're all, they just know what kind of movie they're making. Yeah. And I, I do also have to say that, like, I think that the cast of the original Black Christmas, um, I, I feel like I was struck with the idea that they're, like, each a specific like type of person, right? Yeah. You have the one girl who drinks too much. You have like the girl who uh like you you have Jess was clearly more of a final girl like from the beginning. Yeah, you I think so. You had Claire who was the very like like I don't want to say uptight, but like No, she was a conservative. She was yes. um a little quiet. Yes. But Whereas, like, she was the, the nice girl. Yes. She was the sweet girl. Whereas like the Black Xmas cast, something that I think they did super well is they like they each had their roles generally, but like they all they they all seemed to just like mesh together so much better instead of being like individual pieces. Yeah. I I totally hear you, but I will say my final girl, if I had to choose someone from Black Xmas 2006, we got to find a way to like different. I think just 2006. Okay. From 2006, <laughs> um, I think Michelle Trachtenberg was my final girl. Yeah. I really, I think it was such a shame that she died, but I also heard that Michelle Trachtenberg actually asked the director, she was like, I'm only doing the movie because she was already doing, I think, Buffy and she didn't want to do like car stuff. Okay. She was like, and a, a lot of these girls actually didn't want to do car stuff, but she said, I'm only doing the movie if I have a character who dies. I need to. So she already was on board to, to be a death, but I think she was so likable. She was very strong and she was taking care of her friend. Um, and she was also very funny. She was mm -hmm. just like, oh, no drinking, no drinking. Like when she was like taking <laughs> yeah. care of of a, of her friend, I I think she was set up. She was doing all the right things. And then she just died because she decided to. I think that was so stupid. When yeah. she tried, to, tried the window again, even though it was stuck. But she went back to the window again. And she also hurt Agnes. And that was her chance to 
jump over her mm -hmm. and go out the front door. But instead, she went back to the window. I think that was stupid. But of course, it's a it's a slasher movie. Yep. And in this in this campy slasher movie, she's gonna make the wrong decision. Yeah. Also, I mean, to be fair, like in the moment, you're probably not thinking the most logically that you've ever thought. Oh yeah, I think I would. I mean. Like no. you are being chased by not one but two. We don't know. She didn't know that that moment that there was two killers. Yeah, but we did. That's true. <laughs> um, but that was my funnel girl. I think Katie Cassidy. I think that's her name. I forgot. Oh my god. Let me just double check. Katie Cassidy. I think she did a she did a great job. I think she was your quintessential blonde. Yeah. Lead. <laughs> um, and. How about you? Did you feel like you were more connected to one of the girls than the others? I honestly don't know that I was. I think, um, I, I mean, I, I think I really did like Michelle Trachtenberg's character. I, I get that, like, she didn't want to be the. You were like, kill girl. them all. <laughs> kill them no. all. No, I wouldn't say that. But I just, like, I, I, I mean, really in both movies, actually, I don't know that I was, like, really truly connected with any of the girls. I just, you know, obviously I wanted one of them to live. Yeah. That's fair. Um, let's talk about the house mothers. So we have two different house mothers. All right. Both of them, I think, are funny. Miss Mac from 1974, icon. <laughs> love her. I love a woman who has <sighs> drinks stashed in books, stashed oh. in the toilet, stashed in the medicine cabinet that she uses as mouthwash. I love, I mean, listen, I, I, I would like to just say now unambiguously for people who have a drinking problem, I understand that, <laughs> oh that, my is, God. that it, it is an addiction yes, that needs to be treated seriously, a, yeah. but I loved this. I love that the she was always that they stealing made. a little nip from well, here. It was there. a journey. Like we really, and I think that's what this movie did really well is that we didn't focus on Olivia Hussey that much yeah. until later on in the movie, but we were focused very much on Barb. We were focused on uh, Miss Mac. And I think the fact that we just followed her everywhere and the little knickknacks and weird that like she out of everybody probably should have noticed that there was someone in the house. Yeah. Um, but it just was so funny. She was so hilarious. The the interaction between her and Claire's dad was also really good because Claire's dad was like, I'm gonna talk I'm gonna talk about somebody about God, this this guy. environment. Yeah. And then she's like, Okay. And then she's just trying to hide like the the nude picture that's on the <laughs> wall. So funny. So fucking funny. Um I I think her character is really good. But I just love Andrea Martin too because she at some point, what she calls them like bitches at some point. Yes. Or she was just she like, gathers oh no, them. she was like, you rich bitch or something like that mm -hmm. to Mary Elizabeth Witson's character. Um, I, I also really love that, like, in this case, because we definitely focused more, I think, on an overarching story than the, the, the fact that there is a killer in the house in 1974. Whereas in 2006, it was much more like, like your traditional slasher, like yeah. we don't really well, have many side stories. They took away the element of there's someone in the house to focus more on the backstory. Yes. Yeah. And and I do have to say I really appreciate that Andrea Martin's character, like from the very second they realized something was wrong, she was like, We are going to the car, we are getting out of here. We are oh, leaving. And when like right now. the final girl was having her final girl moment, mm -hmm. Andrea Martin was like Okay, well, you be you be well. I'm gonna go. <laughs> like, yeah. She was like, "I'm gonna I'm leave." I'm not leaving, Lauren. You bitch. <laughs> oh, just, oh my god! It was just it was just so good, yeah. and I think she was also endearing. She was very sweet. Very much so. Um, I I really liked her version of being the house mother in this movie. Um, but also let's talk. There's so there's two different versions of the relationship between Claire and their their family member that comes to see them, right? Yes. In this one, in 2006, it was very different because it takes place in one single night. Yep. Um, so during this snowstorm, we have Claire's sister who comes to, um, who is fucking fierce and looking oh, yes. gorgeous. Love her. The jawline, like she was like, "Huh, I'm Claire's sister. Where the fuck is she?" Like I'm just like, "Oh my god, yeah. where do you get that coat?" Oh, I think Lacey Chabert said like. I love that coat. Yeah. Oh I mean, God. and like, sure, I guess maybe she was supposed to be a little bit of a red herring, but I was like, this woman is too fierce to be a killer. It's I'm too sorry. fierce. Um, I I really liked her character, and I think she held her own. Absolutely. Like she she was what um the dad in 1974 wasn't really doing. 
Um, I think she was she was more like being the spiritual successor to Claire's boyfriend. Oh yes, in the original. Yes, you're right. Um, which is really good. Which also, I mean, there's also the boyfriend talk because there is um the, our leads boyfriends who are also red herrings mm -hmm. right we have katie cassidy's boyfriend who is cheating on her with one of her sisters mm -hmm. and it's not nice and he's also kind of a jerk like he was like you bitches and i was like you know what all of them grab your best heel yeah. and let's fucking stab them yeah this because... is very much like a you don't get to use that word sir yeah. <laughs> sit back down um but i mean he did a great job of being a, uh, a herring and oh, also yeah. because he was such a jerk i really did want him to die so i'm glad that they didn't like <laughs> make him live yeah because i thought that that was the road that they were going down was uh -huh. like oh we're gonna make him live at the end and they're gonna be back in love but no he got his pretty fast yeah they sucked him up into the attic and just stabbed him um which was kind of nuts this movie 2006 also had an obsession with eyes oh my god i don't everything was just like let's grab your eye let's eat your eye oh Leave also, the eyes alone. I heard that eyeballs were actually really tough. I don't. I don't. I, I don't, don't know where know. I heard that. Don't fucking ask um, me. <laughs> I, I've never handled an eyeball of any kind. Not even your mouth. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, but the father in 1974 for Claire's dad, she he was meeting up with her and she she didn't show up which is very unlike claire yep. and so he kind of follows up with going to the sorority house then going to the police station and he's kind of just like meandering following people along seeing he, where they are he was only useful in like two parts of this movie where and the one was when he overheard the detective like taking down uh, when Jess called in to say, I'm getting oh, these yeah. phone calls, and he told John Saxon's character that that was the same address. Yeah. And I, you know what? I'll, I'll take it down to only that one time. He was not even helpful the first time he they went to the police really station. He wasn't really helpful. And he wasn't even comforting that one woman who saw her her daughter. Yeah. He was just like looking uh, oddly like, out well, there. Sucks. But he did. I mean, I also get it. Like, he's the dad, like, he's going through shit. And. I did feel for him when he fainted out of nowhere at the end of the movie because I could just tell like it's a lot. Yeah. And I felt like that was so real uh, such a realistic moment for someone to have mm -hmm. is to just be overwhelmed by the situation. Yeah. Um but yeah, very very two different versions of each character. So I really really feel like we can't compare them. They're both their own thing. Let's move on to the story of it all. Now I know we talked about it briefly before, but did you prefer the most more ambiguous? We don't know who Billy is. We don't know this killer. We don't even know if his character's name is actually Billy. Um, but he talks a lot of trying to like we're trying to grab the story via the the phone calls. He does mention Agnes. It's me, Billy. Oh, it's me, lot. Billy. Uh, we also have the line like she's our family now or mm -hmm. stuff like that, which mm -hmm. is also repeated in the 2006 version. But in the 2006 version, Billy is a very famous um killer and a case and used to be in the household where the sorority lived yeah, i i have to say um because i have a lot of thoughts about the story for both movies but yeah. at the very very top things i did not need in oh. this movie in the remake i stuff the incest plot line the incest i think everyone overall agrees uh, did we did we need that? I could have done without the cannibalism too, but especially the incest, you could have just pulled that right out. Oddly enough, and I don't think the ca cannibalism was kind of crazy. I I it gave me a visual I never thought I would see in my life, which was having someone cut someone's back into a cookie cutter and putting it into an oven and then seeing someone zoomed into I mean, their lips. Been, I, I think he would have found it much more enjoyable had he deep fried the back skin. But I, and then put some barbecue sauce, like not the cookie, not the milk, the milk and meat cookies. No. Oh, maybe that's title of episode. I think I think he would have <laughs> done blue cheese, honestly, for the area of the country that he's in. But regardless, the the incest, I I'm I'm really upset that it was even in it because it was not necessary. It exists, I, I guess, to that make is... you like grossed out 
Um, Go out and kind of really like confirm yeah, but that it was like a rough patch for this kid. Um, but I do think like as a viewer, it's like a little hump that you need to get over. Yeah. In you know like oh it's a good time slasher and then oh okay we're almost done we're almost done okay we made it through we're good now we can like have a a, a little slasher moment after that but it yeah. is questionable don't know why don't know why it's there um not a good time but i like a little backstory i don't mind it but i think it was a little bit excessive and it took away from where i wanted to connect between the two version so like going back to the girls and then going back to the backstory and then going back to the women and then going back to the backstory it kind of felt a little repetitive yeah, i agree um, i mean it, it could have been i think ordered a little bit differently but i did really like the backstory in 74 the yeah. other thing that i really wanted to say that i oh no no i was talking about 2006 oh, okay i yes. think it was too back and forth in 1974 i think it was perfect i think well no because i wanted to know more I wanted to know more of who this person is, but also I think that's the point. Like you, that's just the creepy part about it is you never see his face. You only see his eyes and the shadow of him who looks very, has the same kind of haircut as the boyfriend. Yeah. Um, so it, it makes you feel like, Oh, maybe it is the boyfriend. So it successfully does what it needs to be done with that. Yeah, I do. So I, I, I thought you were talking about the backstory of the movie itself, not specifically the killer. I agree with you. I think that it was too back and forth in 2006, but in 74, I liked that it was like he was just, I mean, the exact same thing that Halloween does, right? Yeah. He's just a shape. And, and he's scary because he could be anything and anyone. You don't know who's like Well, no, that. that's a little bit different because... I think 1974 does it even more ambiguous. There's yeah. very little to do because at least with Michael Myers, you have a name to, to, to attach it to. You saw the beginning, which like you saw that he was a kid. I think the thing that makes Michael Myers scary is that he will, it doesn't, he doesn't, whole prejudice against anybody like he will kill equally and it's scary and he's kind of like in the shadows and he he has no intentions right yeah which is the same here but here we have even less to work with mm -hmm. um yeah i i do really like that though yeah. um and and i think i prefer the killer just being a random person that we don't necessarily know his relation to the house or the girls or why he's there. Yeah. That he could just be anybody. I agree. And, well, we're going to get to it. Um, kills. Before we move on, I do <gasps> want to make one other point about the general storyline of 74. Oh, yes. I think I know I where you're going. love that this movie, like, was sort of political about yeah. how it delivered the story very because political 2006 was just like it was a slasher gore fest right it, it, <laughs> everyone had something happen to their eyes and like that was just <laughs> the, the story of 2006 74 we had a we had our, our lead girl the year after roe versus wade yeah. happened in the supreme court who finds out she's pregnant, talks to her boyfriend, says, I want to get an abortion, and is standing her own when her boyfriend is like, no, I've decided I'm going to quit I'm going to quit school. I've been at this conservatory for too long. I've already destroyed the piano for no reason because the piece that I played didn't sound good, and I <laughs> and I want to just, like, let's just make a life together. And she's like, no, I'm not putting my dreams on hold for you. But And I think I also... Like, I think some people might think, oh, this comes out of nowhere. It's just being political. No, I think it adds to the message of the story because the, this woman is going through this part in her life and she mm -hmm. doesn't want to go down that road. But her boyfriend is not listening to her. Yeah. It's not taking a moment to, to realize how she's feeling, which is very much the whole rest of the town in in this movie yeah the no same one thing. the cops yeah i was gonna say the same thing the cops don't take this seriously yes. until a guy shows up and says no you have to listen to these they girls. have to get the boyfriend like okay the boyfriend comes in you do what needs to be done the the, the father doesn't really pay attention to any of the girl or like really doesn't trust them mm -hmm. so once the the boyfriend comes into play then they get together and they go away and they leave them by themselves in the house yeah you know like so it really 
kind of adds to the story that these women are kind of left to their own devices um and they are the ones who are gonna have to like save themselves in the end but it's like it's almost too realistic like we don't have these women prevailing as much as we think they do as regular slashers like our final girl is very like like the moment where she finds out that the killer is in the, in the house you realize how real this character is yeah she's not the strong final girl like we see in other movies she is by herself and that's fucking scary because now she is going to try to see if her friends are alive and now she's going to try to escape and then on top of that you have your boyfriend who is also haunting you down um it's just it's just so much to deal with and it just very nerve-wracking so i think the political side of things uh one very refreshing to see for yeah. a 1974 movie um that could be very relevant to today mm -hmm. um but i like that it also makes sense in this movie to, yeah. to have it there i just really appreciate that we're able to weave the social commentary into the story without it feeling like you're really forcing it in there. and jess was not apologetic yeah jess was not a person who was like you're not changing you're not changing my mind or she was very weak in that aspect no she kept her word she said you want to change your life so i i need to change my life too that's not like he was like, I'm going to I'm going to marry you. I'm going to quit the conservatory. We're going to do this. And she's like, no, no, that's not the path I want. I have so many things that I want to do. And I was very happy that she did not change that at all to the end of the movie. Yeah, I agree. So let's talk about favorite kills of the movie um, from both movies. OK, for me. I want to say Barb's death was very impactful. I think the unicorn uh, stabbing, yep. which, you know, adding to the um, previous thing that we just said, they kind of made it a point to be like, this killer who is in the shadows um, is attacking this woman in a very vulnerable state, mm -hmm. um, which is, makes it more disturbing. On top of that, cutting back and forth with the kids singing the carols was very, very scary. Yes, that was very scary. A a again, it gets back to that thing that I talked about earlier where it's like, you think that you're safe because someone else is home, but then like yeah. you're at the front door listening to a bunch of kids singing Christmas songs and they don't hear you literally getting murdered. Yeah, and when it comes to the 2006 one, there's a couple actually. I really liked Lacey Chabert's character's death because she's like underneath the the house to go to the generator, mm -hmm. which is the most sucky place to go to fucking fix your thing. Um, and then she gets attacked. I don't know with what. It's like a... Oh, it looks like a trowel. I think yeah. that's what it's called. But like, they he rams it into her head. Yep. And then you see her lifeless eyes mm -hmm. just staring at the screen as he struggles to like take it out. I think that was pretty effective. And I was disturbed yeah. by that scene and second would be michelle trachenberg's death i think the blade oh that was gnarly through the back of her head and then you just see a chunk of it with like skull intense yeah i completely agree with you <clears throat> any disappointing kills though i think andrea martin's death in the remake i was really disappointed by that because she okay. just gets killed by like the ice falling off the house that's, that's fair. Lame. <laughs> that's, that's lame. Like, let her. Let Miss her Mac it got out. fucking hooked. Yeah. And she, she, oh, like, that was another good. An, that, that was, was a good, good one. Kill. Yeah. I I want to say Mary Elizabeth Winstead's death was was kind of disappointed because mm -hmm. it happened off screen, like it was in the car, so you just saw the blood splat. <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, did her head explode? Like, I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this it, she just had like a mind blown moment. She was like, oh, that's what that thing is for, and her head exploded. Yeah, and I didn't really like a lot of the CGI eyes out. Oh yeah, no, I anything. I, I mean, I I can at least like understand eyes are gross. They like freak people out. I get why like you put it in there, but we we lean too far into the eyes. There are I other parts so. of the body that you can like mess up, and it will still gross people out. Yeah. Now, we're, we're at the end, guys. This is the ending of the movies. Um, I think 1974 trumps 
2006. Only because 2006 and based off of the movie, they weren't sure how they wanted to end this movie. Um, so we, I feel like we couldn't, can't get like a accurate depiction of what the ending of this movie should be. But 1974's, where they just leave Jess behind, thinking that she's safe. Yeah. How they have interpreted everything so far. They leave her there sleeping, turn off the lights. You hear creaking happening in the attic. And you see you, like a light turn on. You see the light turn on, and then you just pan out from the the, the bodies of Miss Mac, which they haven't even discovered yet. Yeah. And the body of Claire. You just see the house, kind of like how we started with the movie, and you see a, a policeman right there. And then the, the phone rings. And it just keeps on ringing. And that keeps on ringing until the end of the movie, meaning like the credits play. Yeah. And the phone is still ringing. Oh. We don't get horror movie endings like that anymore. Oh, that was like, it, you didn't need to say anything. Like, you're just left in silence. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that comes into my mind is like, imagine going home after that. How do you feel like yeah. safe and good? We would have to come home and We'd watch like a bunch the of. Attic. We have to watch a bunch of good, happy stuff. Oh, God, yes. I would leave feeling so irked and eerie. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, for 2006, I will give it this. I do love the impalement of Billy. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's that a, was pretty good. I think it's a really good way to, you know, just end it and make sure, like, it's unambiguous. He's dead. He has a tree through him. And, of course, it's all, like, Christmas imagery because yeah. that's his entire thing. And I do like that we end. Uh, the whole movie is riddled with the Nutcracker score. It's like the dun, dun, dun. Oh, mm -hmm. God. I love I the forgot, Nutcracker. Dance I think, of the Sugar Plum Fairies? Yes, that? lots of Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies. It's, like, all over the soundtrack. Like, at this point, put, like, put one of the other, like, upbeat songs behind a chase scene or something. Like, it, like if you're really oh, yeah, going to do that. It's the most wonderful time. While well, somebody's, like, getting, like, yeah. fucking murdered. Yeah, yeah lots that's fucking of, scary. Lots and lots of Nutcracker references. But, I, I mean, I, I do think that, even though we already talked at the beginning of the podcast about how the ending of 2006 feels really drawn out that we could have just like ended it in a different way that might have been more effective yeah um you do still get like the satisfaction of killing agnes and billy we do get a very very unnerving scene that i think sort of kind of meets the the call is coming from inside the house because in 1974 that moment is you get goosebumps and it's so scary because you follow this story and it r reaches that that payoff yeah right but you don't get that you don't get that you know um the the suspense you don't get like the urgency of it needing to be something that they need the cops need to figure out yeah right the whole cop element is taken out um but there is one scene and i forget where they are i think they just discovered michelle treasurer's body and Katie calls someone or Claire and they hear the cell phone ring and they look up and through the cracks, they see that it's in the attic. Yeah. Oh, and you just see the light screen turn on and then the light screen turn back on and they get a call back. All right. That, that was really good. Mm -hmm. I do like, like I wanted more of those creepy elements. Yeah. Um, but it's also differently paced. Like, Black Christmas is kind of a short movie, and so is, eh, eh, kind of. I think Black Xmas is 30 minutes or so, and Black Christmas from 1974 is like an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, so relatively the, the same. But I think 2006 is, is a lot faster paced. It's mm -hmm. a movie that's just like, bang, 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 bang. We're here. You're getting it, and it, it, I think it's pretty great paced. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right, guys. So that was our little recap. We're comparing both movies. We are going to be right back because we are next going to be rating the movies themselves. So stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. It is officially now time for our 
desserts segment and this is the segment where we rate the movies themselves how are we rating them zero to ten billies mm. we always pick a random item or thing in a movie we have to say zero to ten eyeballs zero to ten eyeballs we that's fair to. before we get to the eyeballs though we need to rate it from zero to ten scared cody's mm -hmm. because cody is the scary cat of this of this podcast that's me how scary was 1974 from zero to ten cody's I would give it, I think I would give it a seven and a half. Seven and a half. Or an eight. Because, I, you know, this wasn't, like, really gory. Mm -hmm. But, like, there were several times where it gave me goosebumps. And, and especially that ending was just... It's chilling. Chilling yeah. is a perfect word for it. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I, it's up there. It was a scary movie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually bring it up to another half step which is eight i think i'm going to rate this on how scary it is it it is an eight now is it the scariest movie ever no but it's scary in a different sense like it it reaches different parts of your body that you didn't know you should be scared of like yeah. if you're afraid of like home invasions this will definitely irk you yes um so i think this is just scary enough that it gets the job done, mm -hmm. you know? Zero to 10 scared Cody's for 2006. I would put this at, I think, I wanna say a six, because it was gorier, and I don't like gore, and <laughs> there were definitely some disturbing parts that I didn't appreciate being in the movie. I didn't but appreciate I also, that. I don't want to reward the disturbing parts by giving them a higher scary rating. Damn! So, oh shit! Well, just because I, I I don't want I don't want any of the like many directors and writers and producers that are listening to this podcast to say, oh, oh so yeah. we should put more incest and eyeball oh, stuff no, 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 and no, like no. weird gropey SA stuff in it. No, we don't want that. So I'm not rewarding it with scary points. I'm gonna give it a six. Cody has spoken. Um. I'm gonna give it a five because I, I honestly don't think it was scary. I think there were part I think the disturbing elements scared me more. Um, so I'm gonna just give it a five. Zero to ten eyeballs on how you like this movie overall. Oh, nineteen seventy four. I'm gonna give seventy four a I'm gonna give it an eight also. I, Eight eyeballs. Yeah, All right. I really liked it. I, I love, I love, love, love when we can work social commentary into a movie that makes sense. Yeah, like, I hear you. And I, I just thought that this story, especially knowing that it's, it's one of the origins of the call is coming from inside the house of the slasher genre in general. Mm -hmm. I think that this was really well done. It was a great watch, and I would watch it again for sure. The, what was the rating eight. again? Eight. 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 Um, yeah, I'm gonna do the same thing. I think it's an eight out of ten. Honestly, almost thinking nine because I love this movie, mm -hmm. and for so long I was like Team Black Xmas. I was, and I still am. I still am, you know, um, by its side. But after seeing 1974, it has become one of my favorite movies. Yeah, I loved it. It did everything that I thought it 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 reinvented or like rediscovered some new fear in me that i don't think i've experienced in a while and i i'm gonna give it a nine out of ten actually yeah. I mean, i'm gonna this is like the movie version of like you go to a car show and someone just like taps the hood and it's like they just don't make them like this anymore. oh my god <laughs> <laughs> but i honestly it's gonna be on my rotation i'm gonna watch it every christmas it's similar it's similar to what i think i think halloween is still a scary movie. Mm -hmm. I do find parts of it very scary, um, and that's that's gonna go on par with with Black Christmas. I do always feel bad because I there were so many people that were saying that it's actually Black Christmas, then they they should get their props and their credits for showing elements of the slasher. And I never really watched the movie, so mm -hmm. I was like never understood why that would be. I always thought. In my head, the movie was something different. Yeah. Um, like I always thought it was one of those horror movies that wasn't considered a horror movie. Mm -hmm. It was just like, oh, you know, it has heart elements in it. Um, but now watching it, oh, it's a horror movie, baby. Yes. And yes, it should give it should get all its props that everyone is saying is uh, on starting 
the horror slasher genre, or at least giving elements of it that Halloween, I think, perfected. Yes. Um, would you recommend this to beginners to horror movies? Um, it's I... weird because it's not as scary, but oh, no, no, it is scary. But just enough that I think beginners to horror, the horror genre would enjoy. Yeah, I agree. I think because I think that this is like it's it is very scary, but it's more of an approachable scary. Like yeah. I think that especially because if you're anything like me, even though I am afraid of things, and I didn't watch horror movies when I was a kid. I like I loved like reading the urban legends and like the yeah. scary stories to tell mm, the dark. And like yeah, it's I think one of those. That this is kind of in that same vein because it feels like. You took an urban legend and you put it on the screen. You have that similar ending where it's open ended and you're not safe. You like, yeah. you have the the storyline that goes through it. I think it was a, a really really great movie for someone yeah. to just like pick up and go because then it's not gory to scare you away. No. But I will say there are points of it that can be disturbing. Mm -hmm. So if for beginners to horror, I would introduce others first, but I think this is a good in between. Like yeah. show this and then show Halloween and I think you're on the right path. All right, guys. So before we conclude this podcast, we did say that we would probably choose which one we prefer between the both of them. Do we still want to do that? I think we can still do that. We're all adults, guys. We have room. It's kind of like those uh, when Wait. people say, can you have two best friends? You can't have two best friends. Did we give an eyeball rating for 2006? Oh, shit. Did we not? I don't think we did. Oh, fuck. Zero to ten eyeballs. Okay. so <laughs> um, Fuck. Rewind. Rewind, everybody. You know what? Just to give some suspense for the final rating, I'm going to give it an eight, too. Because as much as like there are parts of the movie I don't like, there's so much about this movie that's iconic. I'm sorry. Especially the cast. I agree. I, I think it's an eight out of ten. <laughs> I love it. I still love the watching experience. I think it's so fun. I can't wait to do like a drinking game with it. Mm -hmm. It's it's bonkers. It's it's campy. And if I'm saying it's good, but I mean, I guess I gave it a good rating, but like people it's not a masterpiece we yeah. know it's not a masterpiece but we know it's not fucking genre bending but it's 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 deep in my heart and yeah. i think it, it's due to nostalgia also yeah it it is still a fun watch and yeah. i do you know since we didn't have a, a whole lot of chance to talk about it during the meats and potatoes i do want to just like circle back to the whole remake thing because i think that while you know i i, I think that this was a really good way to do a remake because you explored so much of the backstory we didn't get yeah we still had a lot of good references it wasn't like the like shot for shot word for word quotes or whatever mm -hmm. in the, for the most part but we there were a lot of things that as we were watching 2006 we were we were able to point out and say like oh that was that's a reference to the first one i'm not yeah. gonna go through it you need to go watch <laughs> or watch along to see it but um i do think that it was a really good remake overall yeah i i don't think it's the the best one personally there is another remake that I think is actually pretty spot on. Um, and we might be talking about it next month. So I'm going to hold that off for now. But I, I agree. I agree with your, your thoughts. I think I think they implemented just enough. And it wasn't just a repeat of the whole thing. But which one would you prefer? I think I prefer 74. Just slightly. This is this is kind of unfair though because we we're coming off a high of yeah, just seeing it. That's true. I I I do think because I think I would watch them for different reasons, right? I would I really liked seventy four, and I would watch it again because I think the story was really well done. It was well told, and like sometimes when when I watch movies from that mm -hmm. era, I can you can kind of tell that it's an older movie. Yeah. Like in, just because the way that horror movies are written and shot and, and given to us as audiences today is different in a way that generally I kind of like a little bit more. But I think that this is an exception to that rule. It was really, really well done. And even though I love all the girls from 2006 and I love the way that they interact, I think I like 74 a little more. That's fair. That's fair. I think I'm coming off the high as well of 1974. I got to choose 1974. It's just, it was so good. I really, it's become one of my, now I can say proudly one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. I do love Black Christmas. And I mean, that could change within the next year. Maybe in, we'll do a, like a 50th anniversary, like re-rating. Maybe we'll re-rate it. But I will say this. I don't think, as you said before, 
you watch them for two different reasons, right? They're two different feels. They're two different vibes. But they're essentially like the, the same soul yeah. is there. I don't recommend watching them back to back because we did. We watched it back to back. And I think how I left 1974, it was hard to now re-navigate my feelings yeah. and watch 2006 because they were so different. So I would say... If you're like on a slasher binge, like your normal campy slasher, watch like Friday the Thirteenth. Watch um, any remake of anything, like, and then put 2006 part of that little collection, right? Yeah. Then you watch that, and then 1974, you have a different vibe with that. Watch 1974's uh, Black Christmas. Watch Halloween. Watch maybe something a lot a lot more darker. Like I think that's the vibe that you're going. Like oh, I want to be scared. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other ones is a whole different vibe. So I think that's how I'm going for, and I think that's that's my answer. All right, guys, that's it. Yeah, I think I had a lot of fun. This is the reason why I miss doing the podcast so much. Yeah, me too. Because it's just like conversations between us both. We're we're talking about things. Please go visit our previous episodes. Mm -hmm. Granted, I will say. The, the audio may not be as well or the edits. I'm just saying there, I was still learning. Everyone reminds Sergio that he is great at what he does. No, nah. stop being so hard. I on do himself. have some insecurities. Um, but there are, we have great discussions. Yes. It was a lot of fun. And Cody ha is very opinionated. <laughs> I am. And remember, if it's scary, if it's a good scary movie, he will most likely rate it. Uh, low because it, he does not like being scared it depends but I, this movie you gave it a high well, rating so well, for me it's you're all going about, soft you're going to <laughs> no it is it is and has always been about the balance between scariness and how much the movie ends up being enjoyable that's fair and some movies and we're not gonna name names are really <laughs> heavy on the scary and give me nothing to enjoy about the movie yeah this was not one of them that's fair um but yeah go check out our our episodes we have like 80 of them out we're hoping that for 2024 we reach 100 episodes of the podcast um and we have a lot more guests planned in the new year so please stay with us on this journey we're going to try to aim for it to be weekly there's not going to be a new one next week because we're recording one next week mm -hmm. um so expect that to start officially in the new year so somewhere in january but we'll let you guys know uh again we're also planning to put on watch alongs for the movies that we're going to be covering and analyzing and just deeply going into so please stay tuned for that um and if there's any suggestions please feel free to uh email us yeah. uh, message in the discord there's a channel for suggestions um as well as follow us on twitter at the horror bandwagon or on instagram at the horror bandwagon and you can also look up us look up us up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But you're probably watching this from YouTube probably. or you're hearing this on Spotify or any other podcast platform. So, yeah, check it out. Check our things there. We also have a Patreon. Patreon. We have different tiers which include the the tiers the segments that we just talked about, which is just desserts, bloody scratch that. Bloody appetizers, meats and potatoes, and just desserts. Yeah. Uh, they're different tiers. Each of them offer different things, some additional things, some exclusive things, as well as we have a YouTube membership. So if you want some exclusive live streams, some exclusive emotes, mm -hmm. there's two different tiers over there. So if there's different ways that you can support us if you want to. But all our Patreon members, all our YouTube members, thank you so much for all your support. We truly, truly, you have no idea how much we appreciate it. Yeah. That's it. You're just gonna say yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You, you covered yeah. you covered all the bases. Sorry, I just Thank sometimes you. I get on a roll. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, both our uh, especially our members and our Patreon members, um, but for all of you who are out here listening, watching, supporting yeah. us in any way, we appreciate you so much. Our channel has grown so much over yeah. the past year. We are really, really proud of how far we have come with your help. Yes, and. You know, we couldn't be more honored that you're joining us here for another thing of just listening to us talk yeah. about stuff. So hopefully you enjoy this. Hopefully yeah. you just enjoy watching us just talk. But well, again, we'll catch I, all in the new year. We hope that you have a happy holiday. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. And we will guys see you next year. Until then, we have been your stories for hard analysis, criticism, and spooky. Okay. And sometimes kooky. Entertainment. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.